Hello everyone and welcome to this new series covering the Enhanced Input Action System. In this series we're going to go over the system itself, how we use it, what can you do with it and a load of little, little tips and tricks with the settings that you have available to you. So in this first episode we're going to go over, do an overview of the system, looking at different input actions, mappings and how we create them. So let's get started. Okay, so we're going to take a look at the Enhanced Input Action System. This is a new input system introduced in 5.1. I've done a video on it before covering its aspects, but we're going to go through this in finer detail and show you how to set up various different um, inputs that you may be familiar with in other games. So first of all, let's just start off with covering the basics. Uh, an input, Enhanced Input Action System is a new system, and it mostly just, what it does, it changes inputs into assets. So the way this works is you go into your project and you can make a new folder and add actions as assets by going to the menu, input, and choosing input action. And in this example, we've got jump, look, and move already made for us. So let's take a look inside one of these and so you can see what they do. Let's go into jump here. So when you create jump, uh, we have a description and we've got inside the action settings, we can trigger when it's paused, we can reserve it for mappings. We'll cover mappings at a later point. Uh, value type. So this changes what kind of information we're getting out of this. So digital means it's going to be off or on. You're either pushing the button or you're not. Whereas if we choose access 1D, that's going to return a float. So that'd be more for like a trigger access maybe. Uh, access 2D is more for your thumbsticks and things like that, which return two coordinates. And then we've got access to 3D uh, there too. And all these can return all those values. Now, next up, we've got triggers and modifiers. Tr triggers indicate how this thing can be triggered when you are pushing the button. So you can see here, jump, they've already put in two triggers for you, one for press and one for release. And that will trigger based upon those inputs. The modifiers change the value that you've come out of here. So if you want to manipulate the value, specifically if it's a float or an axis value, you can manipulate it and change it to something else based upon the modifier associated with it. Below that, we've got input consumption. This changes how you consume inputs. And uh, we'll be covering that again in a later video. And back on their mappable, we've got mappable settings here too. So you create your inputs as individual uh, assets, but then these are collected together and put inside something called a context. And if I go back up, you'll see the one that comes with the third person template called IMC default. This is your mapping context. So you open this up and if we expand up our mappings, we can see jump there and open this up further. And we can see the buttons that have been assigned to jump space bar, gamepad face button bottom, which is your A button, for example, on an Xbox controller and touch one, which means a, a single finger tap. And each of these can also have their own triggers modifiers. These uh, will uh, can either override or inherit the ones from the action itself as well, which you can set here in setting uh, behaviors here. Then we've got each of those laid out for every single input going forward. You can see here move has got a lot more in here. Taking into account of WASD, got the up arrows, down arrow, right arrow, left arrow, and the left thumbstick to the axis. And we'll go through these in a second with more detail. I um, just want to show you how we then assign the context first. So if I go back to my player character and see how this is achieved. So at some point at the start of your game, before you can actually use the inputs, you need to register them. And so we typically will do this on a begin play event, on the character, on the controller, whatever it may be. But essentially what you could do is go get the player controller and you need to get... Uh, get the enhanced input local player subsystem and then you just add the mapping context and choose your mapping context you want to add and if you want to swap mapping context or add a different one for you like for example changing to a different uh, vehicle or changing controls you can put in a new mapping context at that moment in time okay and that's basically it and then we can add these input actions by just searching for our input action assets and just like ia jump for example and you'll find input action events jump Now, as you can see, compared to the previous input system, there's a lot more options on here. We've got triggered, we've got started, ongoing, cancelled, and completed. So let's explain the difference between each of these inputs. 
started. Makes sense. Is as soon as the uh, input is starting to do its job. So not necessarily triggered, just started. Triggered is when we've actually met the threshold of the trigger values. So you saw earlier I can add trigger modifiers to my input actions. This is where that happens. Ongoing means whilst the key is being pushed or held down or while the input action is executing, that will happen. So it's almost like a tick event for it. Uh, cancelled is when we break out of that and it's cancelled by not us releasing the key or anything like that, but cancelled by something else. And then we've got completed is when we finished and released the key. Alongside that, we've got some values. We've got the action value itself. This is the value associated to the input action. So in this case, it's a Boolean because it's jump. And then we've got the elapsed seconds and triggered seconds. These relate to you holding down the key. If I was to hold down the button, I can return how long I've held down button down for versus how long it's been triggering for. And if I want to manipulate or read the input action itself directly for UI reasons, I can easily access the input action via the input action pin. So as I said, the move has a number of uh, trigger modifiers on their uh, input action. So let's take a look at how they have done their input actions on the inputs themselves. So I'm going to go to the move one. Uh, also, in the context I need to go to. Right, uh, context, there we go. And for this, we've got basically three sets of controls. We've got WASD, up, down, left, right arrows, and the gamepad left thumbstick. And each one of these is going to have different trigger modifiers for their keys. So let's take a look at W. W, as you can see, is pretty simple. There's no extra triggers. And the modifier it has is a swizzle input axis values. Now, what the hell is a swizzle? Now, because we're asking move to be a two-dimensional axis and the WASD don't have any two-dimensional axis, they're only one-dimensional, it's either pushed or it's not pushed. So, so what Swizzle does is it flips it from being a X-coordinate to a Y-coordinate because by default, all your keys on your keyboard are X-coordinates. So when you push them, they put in X1. So Swizzle will just flip it around and make it Y instead. So that's what we're doing with the W there. And you can see it happening again for D. Um, not D. Uh, S, sorry. S, you can see the swizzle happening again. Um, over here for the S key to go down. But we've also got this negate. And again, because the buttons only go either off or on, you can push them or you don't, the negate is going to take whatever value it outputs and basically put a negative in front of it. So make it a scale of negative one. Negate is also used on our A key. As you see there. Now there's no swizzle this time because A and, and D are horizontal keys. That's for you going along the x-axis. So we don't need to swizzle that. But we do need to negate the A key there. If I go to D, you can see it requires none of them because D is both on the x-axis and is uh, positive. So you don't have to negate it or swizzle it. And the same has been done for our arrows because they basically function exactly the same. Like that. Okay. Now for the gamepad, the thumbstick though, this is actually a little bit simpler because they don't have um, a, a one directional input. It's not just off or on. Your thumbstick is the two dimensional axis already. So that saves that having to swizzle or anything like that. But what is useful to do is to add a dead zone modifier. A dead zone basically means that if I expand it open, it has a threshold of 0 0.2 and 1, meaning that if the movement of the thumbstick is underneath 0 0.2, then it's not going to register it. It's going to ignore it at zero. So dead zone is very useful for controllers because controller joysticks are very rarely dead on zero. After especially wear and tear, they will drift slightly a little bit and will no longer be zero or remain stationary. They might have a bit of giving them. So we don't want to ever say zero. We want to put in a dead zone to sort of simulate that going down. The scalar settings just change the input into a, uh, a strength, basically. So with the gamepad and the thumbstick, the strength it's been given is 50 and 50 in the X and Y. So it's 50 times stronger than just moving it up and down one 
Okay, uh, if we move just up and down one, it's gonna, your cap's going to move very, very slowly. So they add some sensitivity to the uh, gamepad. And so when you see settings in the game menu for like sensitivity, that's basically what you're changing. You're changing this scaling value here. And we can see this is done exactly the same for look as well. We can see we've got uh, on the gamepad that's... Uh, oh, no, they haven't done it for the gamepad for that one. They've just done dead zone on the scalar there. Um, but we negated the uh, 2D axis, negating in the Y axis there only because looking up is negative. You want that to be negative, um, but you want to change it to a positive. So it's like you're flipping it. Because um, up in the world is positive, but up on the screen and inputs is negative. So you flip it. Okay. So that's the basics of our IA move and our inputs in general. And as I said, in, over the course of this series, we're going to go through a lot more detail about the enhanced input action system and talk a lot more about how you can use it for various different inputs and, and tricks that you often see in video games. So there you go, that is our enhanced input action system covered. We've now covered what assets are involved and how we actually get started and what they all mean. So in the next episode, we're going to go through and set up an interaction and talk about how to do a hold and button for your hold to interact, a very common feature that we found in many video games. So if you want to watch that video next, you can watch it on patreon.com forward slash Ryan Laley before anyone else, as well as take part in our creator challenge and many other exclusive benefits for patrons as well thank you so much for watching make sure you subscribed and i'll see you next time bye everyone